because if you can't explain why the cosmological constant is small, you haven't really explained how the universe got to be so large. And so you haven't explained why there, why, why there was a lot of room for, for, for this order to grow. Um, another, another a, 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 and this is where the landscape of, of string theory and eternal inflation is going to come in uh, a little bit later in this uh, talk. Do you feel like the cosmological constant has to be actually very small in magnitude, or just would it would a, would a relatively large negative cosmological constant do? Uh, no, it wouldn't do because um, so so it doesn't really matter what the sign is. If, if the, maybe I should have said this, if the if the if the cosmological constant is positive, um, if the energy density of the vacuum, in other words, is is, is positive, uh, what happens is that. Um, if you sit somewhere in such a universe, it's like you're living in a box. Okay, what it does is it makes the universe uh, expand very rapidly at an exponential rate, uh, and as a result, there's some sort of sphere at a certain distance away from you, beyond which things are moving faster than the speed of light away from you. And so, as far as you're concerned, there's you know that that's not part of the world that you can see, and and so. You know all the entropy that can, that can ever sort of hang together in one place, so that you could say, "Oh, here I see a lot of uh, disorder. I see a lot of stuff." Uh, basically, you have to fit into this box whose size is governed by um, by the value of the energy of the vacuum. And the, the more energy you have in the vacuum, the smaller this box gets. Uh, that's what I meant when I said the universe couldn't have been as large as we know it to be. But if if the energy density of the vacuum is negative, uh, then then what happens <coughs> instead uh, is you don't get that type of box. You don't get a box because the universe is, is, is accelerating away from you really fast. Um, you get a different kind of box where you know you, you guarantee that the universe will actually recollapse and into a sort of big crunch uh, on a time scale that again is inversely related to the amount of negative vacuum energy. So it could it could be spatial. And so by causality, yeah. But then again, by, by you know because light and everything else can only travel up to finite speed. Um, that means that, that there's only a, a finite size region, roughly a, the size of you know, how far light can get in that time between the big crunch and the big bang, um, that, that can hang together and that you would ever see if you were in such a universe. And, and so, uh, again, for all practical purposes, uh, you know, the maximum entropy that anyone could ever talk about would be, uh, would be incredibly small if the vacuum energy was naturally uh, its magnitude is naturally large. So, so this is one, one problem in getting the universe to be large. You have to explain why the vacuum is. Um, and, and slow roll inflation is, well, what we talked about from, from, from you know, to connect it with what I've been talking about, it's the thing that solves the flatness problem. It's the thing that explains why it is possible to have the universe at one instant of time look almost exactly like you know, the flat Euclidean geometry that we all know and love over enormous distance scales, not just over uh, this tiny little flat distance, which is what you would have naturally expected. You know, you take a universe that's crumpled up and, and you have uh, a dynamical evolution that is quite natural and, and easy to get, uh, which stretches this out so that each crumple now looks actually like, uh, like a, a piece of flat space uh, if, if you look at it on any uh, well, uh, on any length scale uh, smaller than say the current size of the universe, um, so I don't want to go into the details. Of also, I mean, Andre has explained it rather well, but I want to discuss to what extent this solves or worsens the problem because there's a lot of controversy, and I don't actually know. Uh, I, I think I'm on your side, Andre. Though I'm not completely. I'm not completely sure that we would argue about this the same way. Um, le le let me first mention the objection that is sometimes <laughs> raised against inflation. The way that I understand this objection, uh, it, it's basically this. Well, so at the end of inflation, um, inflation produces a universe which looks spatially flat on enormous distance scales and in which there is a homogeneous distribution of matter. Um, and, and so that would be sort of the, the starting point of ordinary cosmology as we knew it before inflation was invented. Um, and notice that that starting point, while it has very little entropy compared to today, uh, has enormous entropy compared to, well, let's run the clock backward, through the period of inflation, 
back to some universe where there wasn't any matter and maybe just a scalar field high up on some hill that was about to start rolling down. And the universe was tiny and the entropy was much, much smaller still. Okay. And now I could go ahead and accuse Andre of just worsening our problem because, you know, it was already bad enough to have a small entropy to explain. Now I have to explain this even smaller one uh, that, that I needed in order to get inflation started. It's even more unnatural. Now I think that's a crazy objection. Because it's already clear that we have a problem, and it's, it's, it's arguing um, about, you know, cents when, when you owe somebody millions of dollars. It's, 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 it's a quantitative argument that sort of misses the main qualitative point. We could just as well complain about any other established part of cosmology, say nucleosynthesis, that at the end of this process, which explains things beautifully, it explains where all the, the you know, the, the light nuclei come from and it gets things quantitatively right and so on, just, just as inflation does. Um, we could still complain that, well, the entropy at the beginning of nucleosynthesis was, was smaller than at the end, because the entropy always keeps going up you know, as time goes on. And so anything that takes us back further and, and deepens our understanding of the early universe by taking us to an even earlier time and explaining a bunch of, a bunch of things in, in terms of a simple model um, could be accused of worsening the problem of the low initial entropy. Okay. Uh, and and it's, it's a little bit silly because the problem is there no matter what. And it doesn't really matter if it's, you know, too low by a little bit well, more. Why is it a problem? Well, so, good. Why is it a problem? So, um, one, one attitude is to say, um, look, there's a theory of initial conditions, right. which maybe we don't understand yet, zero, but... Right? But sorry, is the entropy zero in the beginning? It, I have no idea. Uh, I know that it had to be very small. Okay. But well, in, in fact, it, it depends on the model. I'll, I'll just give you one where it doesn't have to be very small. But but um, but you know, it, it it seems to me that that uh, in this case, inflation is, is being accused of something ridiculous. I mean, it, it, it it's it, it's just another theory that takes our understanding uh, to, to an earlier time yet. And, and then, therefore, by just running the second law backwards to a lower entropy. Okay? But, but uh, you know, the question of explaining in the first place why the entropy started low is, is just orthogonal to that. It, it, it's a separate problem. Where inflation actually does help. So, so in, in this respect, I think it, it doesn't do anything. It's just, um, you know, it doesn't make things worse. But it actually makes things better on the other end, as, as in my perspective. It, it helps explain... Uh, why the maximum entropy could, could be so large by explaining one of the necessary conditions, the flatness of the universe, uh, in a simple model. Uh, so, so I think it's you know clearly a net plus. Um, now, at, at this point, maybe it's it's a good point to. Uh, by the way, how much time do I have? I have no idea. Either how much I have to start with. Time. Time. <laughs> <laughs> Where the problem of time starts. <laughs> yeah, so we've got uh, yeah. maybe another five minutes and so oh, we can leave some time good. for discussion. That's good, yeah. So, so let me turn to anthropic arguments. You could, have, um, you, you could have said something like this, you know, um, well, maybe a system spends most of its time in, in, a max, in a state of maximum disorder in what we would call thermal equilibrium perhaps. Um, but in such a state of maximum disorder, well, everything is completely disordered. You don't have any free energy to burn up. You don't have anything, any useful kind of energy that's still available. Uh, everything is basically waste product. Okay. So, so obviously, you know, if you imagine that the world was a sort of box in which these, these recurrences happen once in a while, you wait for an insanely long time and the disorder, by some crazy fluctuation, will reassemble itself into some ordered structures. Uh, maybe that's what happened. You know, maybe the universe is like that box, and and you know, the universe has all the time it wants, so we can wait, and then you know, we'll find ourselves as observers <coughs> living during those very special, very rare eras uh, in the history of this box.